Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Politics of Gender, episode four or five. I forget. We are still going through Gender Trouble. Our favorite book. But we hope that we're going to be done today. That is the goal. Not because we haven't been enjoying this immensely, but as you may have noticed if you're following along, um, she says the same thing in a lot of different ways. So we think that we can kind of condense this last bit and really give our takeaway on Judith Butler's uh, Gender Trouble, which, again, is a seminal work because in some ways... All of the experiences we have with um, gender confusion and sort of uh, uh, conflicting claims about gender and sex are all really contained in here in a sort of uh, seed, you know. Seed form or rhetorical question form. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. So um, if you've been up, if you have been with us to this point, you know we are on chapter three. Or no, two and Chapter, three. Yeah, two and three. The last two chapters, <laughs> there's three chapters. Just saying the last two chapters kind of is a little misleading. Yeah. But we're going to go light on chapter two, as you mentioned. But we will go through it. Um, so without further ado, chapter two, prohibition, psychoanalysis, and the production of the heterosexual matrix. So in this chapter, she has a little bit of a preamble uh, and then she starts going section by section, uh, different authors she starts taking a look at and critiquing. Yeah. But I think that the the preamble is, is, is helpful. So I'm going to read uh, a part of it. So this is the first paragraph on chapter two. On occasion, feminist theory has been drawn to the thought of an origin, a time before what some would call patriarchy, that would provide an imaginary perspective from which to establish the contingency of the history of women's oppression. Okay. Uh, and then the next paragraph, although the turn to a pre-patriarchal state of culture was intended to expose the self-reification of patriarchy, that pre-patriarchal scheme has proven to be a different sort of reification. Yeah. Okay, what is she saying here? So uh, the basic idea is this. So one, um, one feminist movement uh, is, to, is to turn back the, the historical clock um, and find what was humanity like before the patriarchy. Because if you can find a pre-patriarchal human society, yeah. then it means that the patriarchy is not inevitable. This is not just the way it's supposed to be. It's contingent. Mm -hmm. didn't have to happen. And patriarchy here, because uh, she's describing a lot of different people's takes on what the patriarchy is, can pretty much be summed up as the systemic oppression of women. Um, yeah. Which she already takes issue with as a category, but uh, this is a, a, a new new critique that she's she's offering. Okay. So it's basically uh, the idea that um, if I if I can if I can control the narrative of the past, then I can control the future. Mm -hmm. So the story that the the patriarchy is going to tell itself is this is the way that things have always been. Yeah, I control this narrative of the past, and I can tell you about the future. This is the way it's always going to be. Right. And so if I can change that narrative, then I can also change the narrative of the future. You know, and I think they're totally on something. I think that is true. I mean, it's basically the plot of Fiddler on the Roof. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That was that didn't land. Continue. Um, but they so they understand the power of narrative. Yeah. Um, but her point is that there is no pure past that you can right. get to. Mm -hmm. What is this uh origin story and, and this is really almost identical to your critique of the liberals early on namely a state of nature myth right where the critique is that you say that this is how man originally was but you can't have that vision except for from your current cultural construction it's always going to be affected by it there's no ability to access a pure time before language before discourse before um civilization so and not only can you not accomplish that, but uh, in your attempts to accomplish that, you are just reifying a, a new narrative. You're asserting a new narrative which precludes all other narratives. Which I find funny because this is classic Butler in that her biggest insult to the feminists for doing this is that they are, she says, parochial. So they're just being 
they're just being the patriarchy, but like a little differently. So she says, this recourse to an original or genuine femininity is a nostalgic and parochial idea that refuses the contemporary demand to formulate an account of gender as a complex cultural construction. This ideal tends not only to serve culturally conservative aims, the horror, but ah. to constitute an exclusionary practice within feminism. So what she's saying is, you, you know, the old phrase, maybe it's not old, you can't dismantle the master's house using the master's tools, or I think that's a bad retelling of it, but you can't just do what patriarchy does for the aims of feminism. Mm-hmm. You expect that to, to work. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so and that's then how she goes into, I think you were going to help me out with her discussion of structuralism a little bit, right? Oh as, yeah. As one of the examples of mm-hmm. an attempt to go to a pre-discursive past and, mm-hmm. um, and this is the attempt of the structuralists. And so what she ends up doing in this whole chapter is looking at different structuralist accounts of how did we get from sex to gender? Uh, how is this constructed? And so in the first section, structuralism's critical exchange, she's looking at uh, Levi Strauss in particular. And so the, the question at hand in this section is how was gender constructed from sex? And so Levi Strauss is saying that the way this came about is that you had uh, these tribes that were uh, masculine, uh, patriarchal driven tribes and um, the way that they were able to relate to each other was through the feminine. So you had these masculine identities and in order to like ease the tension between these masculine identities or in order to unify the masculine identities into one tribal identity, you did it through the symbol of the bride who is not an identity in herself but is rather just this relationary term, yeah. this exchange. Mm-hmm. Um, Women like words should be things that were exchanged. So uh, so she explains Levi Strauss's position, and then she goes and critiques it, which is basically her mode for the rest of the book. This is what they say. Here's what's wrong with it. Mm-hmm. And her critique is that what this does is just assumes another totalizing law, and she's ag- very against anything that's totalizing, because that's the same thing as a totalizing narrative. Yeah. And so now you have a new totalizing law that you have to uh, explain. Um, So the law that is kind of fundamentally shaping the uh, female as the symbol of exchange is the taboo against homosexuality. So these male identity tribes cannot become unified because there's a taboo against that and so what you need is this relational term in between and then you avoid the taboo and you run to the problem well where did this taboo come from so she says the taboo against the act of um hetero incest heterosexual incest between son and mother um as well as that incestuous fantasy and then later on the homosexual uh impulse uh, the taboo against homosexuality are instated as universal truths of culture um but again she wants to say that that just doesn't um, doesn't appear as necessary. Earlier on, she says that uh, Levi Strauss um, induces from the presumed universal structures of culture. He he has takes up the retrospective position of a transparent observer, and she's obviously denying that this is the case. That he's essentially just making a conjecture and then positing it as a necessary history. Um, which in a way, like it's sort of a cheap shot or it's a way uh, there's, this section is really short. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason is because she's not actually even addressing, you know, uh, Levi Strauss on his own terms. She's just saying like, yeah, well that doesn't have to be true. You know, like maybe that's what happened. Maybe it wasn't, there's no necessity to your argument. It's just conjecture. So, yeah, she makes a lot of very minimalistic claims and she doesn't have to because she's not trying to. Uh, assert her own totalizing yeah. system. All she has to do is trouble others and and move on. That's it. She's lucky in that regard. Catholics don't get that luxury. We have to like assert something. Yeah, we have to try. 
Uh, so we do chapter two or part two of part two. Part two of two. Um, on page forty-seven. Uh, so this one is Lacan Riviere, and then the strategies of masquerade. Um, mm-hmm. and so uh, this uh, structuralist construction story is uh, using the term masquerade to describe uh, what women are doing. Mm -hmm. Um, Her main critique of this is that, uh, uh, what does she write? Uh, On the one hand, if the being, the ontological specification of the phallus is, is masquerade, then it would appear to reduce all being to a form of appearing, the appearance of being, with the consequence that all gender ontology is reducible to a play of appearance. Okay, what is she saying in the sentence? So you're saying that um, what women are, are compelled to, to do and to be is this masquerade. So what do you mean by that term? Are you saying that really what's going on is that there is nothing real, there is no gender ontology, and ontology just means being. So there is no real woman, it's all just a play of appearances, or the other way that you could use this term, masquerade, is to understand that it is a mask of something, Mm -hmm. actual real. Mm -hmm. So she says maybe it's suggesting that there is a being or an ontological specification of femininity prior to the masquerade, a feminine desire or demand that is masked and capable of disclosure. Um, So she's just troubling uh, the use of that term. They're using this word masquerade. Are you intending to say that there is some kind of ontological reality here? Or are you implying that it's all just a play of appearances? Yeah. And then later on, she actually shows her hand and tells you what she thinks about it, what she thinks is actually happening. And we'll find that in the section on yeah. performativity. Yeah, and I think we should move on because there's going to be um, a deeper discussion into um i mean these are beginning to take up a lot of freudian accounts and post-freudian accounts of um identity and we're going to tackle that more clearly i think in the work of um zizek with, with whom butler often debates so i'm happy to move on to uh three if you are mm-hmm. okay all right where to go What's the title of three? Morning and Melancholia or something like that? Yeah, Freud and the Melancholia of Gender. Oh, man. It's wild. Okay. So, I think we need um, just a basic description of the Freudian theory of mm-hmm. the consolidation of gender identity. And maybe it would be helpful to say like what the problem he's facing is. Um, so... Basically, the question is, if it's the case that really male and female, uh, man and woman, are these constructs, then Butler's work seems to run into the problem of um, psychology, because there is a internal identity that people seem to have as being male, being female, being mm-hmm. girl, being boy, being man, being woman, that is often asserted as something that's primary. Um, And this even works within materialism because it's not actually a dealing with the given. So it's not saying, okay, you're created as a woman, you're created as a man in any way. Um, It's just saying that you identify as such as a subsequent prior act or Mm -hmm. subsequent act to your being, to your existence at all. And for Freud, it's it's not it's all wrapped up in how we become thinking subjects at all. So it's not simply that you have like, you know, and we know this, right? Just look at children. You're not you're not like a thinking subject, and then you start to identify as you know this or that gender as a sort of rational act. It's like somehow becoming um, identifying yourself to yourself, becoming capable of self identity, capable of language, standing out as your own subject seems to be wrapped up in in identifying yourself as a boy or a girl, having some initial inkling of sex differentiation. And so, again, we're going to go through all this and when we tackle some other authors, but 
basically the, the thinkers that she goes after here are all de are all dealing in one way or another with Freud's claim that um, this identification happens with the break from the mother-child relationship so that originally the child is just this complex of drives that are all perfectly met um, in the body of the mother. So mm -hmm. breastfeeding, like pregnancy itself, holding this whole relationship is one where people like Freud start to puzzle, you know, to have a certain puzzle where it's like, well, this seems like a perfectly self-satisfied existence. Like why mm -hmm. would, why would the human being ever ascend beyond this um, complete satisfaction within the drives? And obviously they're not going to posit some, you know, uh, teleological, you know, maturity that is coming from God in any way. They're going to posit some kind of mechanistic approach. So like something that happens to this being that then makes it, different mm -hmm. okay so the, the basic description people are probably familiar with it is that um at some point the maternal body as a source of complete drive fulfillment um is prohibited um by the father and this is called the castration complex again we don't need to go into this too much but basically um this separates the child as it were from the maternal body is no longer allowed to just identify entirely with the mother so then there's a certain crisis mm -hmm. which a loss which the then yeah a loss and then something needs to happen uh in order to to get out of crisis to consolidate um to be stable in some way i mean it's really mm -hmm. you're left in primal. a moment of chaos i'm not who i thought i was my mother is not me what mm -hmm. am i which, again, we speak of it in language terms where the I is supposed, but obviously this is the first instance of mm -hmm. I as well, is in this kind of chaotic, suddenly I'm not the mother. So the subject really is a negation in this sense. It's like where within the Christian tradition you would expect to say that the subject is a positive creation. Within this tradition, it's much more like the loss of the mother is the identity of the mm -hmm. subject. It is the um, creation of the of the I, I suppose. And then what they do, uh, the you know, the, to identify, you either identify with the mother or the father. Um, and there's complex sort of ways of doing this and ways of failing to do this properly, which Freud thought produced homosexuality when there was a failed identification. Um, and heterosexuality when there was sort of a successful identification, which in this Butler troubles as reading in sort of the results and making it natural to do one versus the other where she mm -hmm. doesn't think it's natural at all. She thinks it's part of our own um, reduction of gender identity to a heterosexual um, reproductive sphere that makes one pathway of identification normal versus another. Yeah. She, um, she uses the word meta narrative. actually. This is on page 65. She writes, the structure of this particular meta-narrative of infantile development figures sexual dispositions as the prediscursive, temporally primary, and ontologically discrete drives which have a purpose and hence right. a meaning prior to their emergence into language and culture. Uh, whenever you see the word meta-narrative for a postmodern, that's a huge, big red flag, right? This overarching story this totalizing system mm -hmm. and so meta narrative is always an insult is what i'm getting at yeah. um so and that's it, her insult for freud this is just another meta narrative right like the the results are being read into the state of nature myth um namely the result of producing a heterosexual reproductive couple is mm -hmm. being read back into what constitutes the normal um within psychological development um yeah, so you can see again, like we're not, we're not just uh, making stuff up when we say it's off. Like this really is a repetition of the same, mm -hmm. you know, just with different thinkers. So um, let's move on to section four. Yeah, I'm trying to remember if there's anything else. I feel like there was. Um, yeah, I mean, her conflict with within psychoanalysis goes on. Um, and she wants to argue at some point, maybe, maybe the one thing to point out in this that will be helpful to us is that this idea of identity only is being established through the rejection of some other, mm -hmm. I think Butler does take up. And not just in terms of Freudian psychoanalysis, but in terms of 
um, going further into just the ways we establish ourselves as, as an identity. Um, and I think that the, the reason this is important is that you have to understand it as what is to be done given the absence of creation, the absence of a given, mm-hmm. right? Because we talk about humans constructing, and often I think Catholics speak about the postmoderns as as sort of like um, uh, the superhero Green Lantern who can just make constructs and like make positive things exist with his yeah. like, green power ring, and that's that's what's so <laughs> wrong about them is that they have this given world, but they're just trying to like construct it. Mm-hmm. But when you read them, you realize that the only sort of construction that they think is possible is destruction. Like, mm. oh yeah, um, you don't establish a positive identity because you have to deal with the prohibitions and the law that's forcing you in one way or the other. The only way you establish yourself as being male, being female, being this versus that, being a subject, is by the exclusion of some other, the repudiation of some other. That's the primary thing. Um, to the idea that you simply have self-identity as a kind of gift just doesn't really make sense within their world. It's that what I experience as self-identity is a sublimated way of saying I'm not that. Mm-hmm. And so she says this in terms of sexual orientation, right? Like a heterosexual is for her, for Butler, and she brings this out in this, is a repressed homosexual. So there's original homosexual sort of identifications with the same sex that happen in infantile, like in your... Uh, sort of early childhood mm-hmm. um, d- development of a gender identity. And so heterosexuality is only established through the repression and expulsion and then ultimately the social prohibition against homosexuality. But you'd think, because you're reading Butler, like, oh, so so that's her like critique of heterosexuality. It's really homosexual. But she thinks the same thing about homosexuality. Mm-hmm. Homosexuality is a repudiation of the heterosexual. So the point is that there's no positive creation in this universe. Um, we are able to construct by destroying others. And she'll talk more about this, but I think it's really important to realize it's not a, uh, it's not just this like free form, happy universe of whatever we imagine we can do. In fact, this is something she denies often throughout the book that we are essentially constrained by what we can destroy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or what we can make appear. Yeah. The illusions that we can 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 make so in a sense she is limited uh, and she says this later on she's limited by the tools that are available to her you can't create an illusion with nothing um but we'll get to that at the end okay all right just wanted to add that uh the next section gender complexity and the limits of identification um so she begins by Opening, saying the foregoing analysis of, uh, so those are the past couple sections so that we looked at with Freud and Lacan and Levi Strauss, um, offer competing versions of how gender identifications work, indeed of whether they can be said to work at all. So we just looked at some different structuralist approaches. We've looked at critiques. Everyone seems to have a a slightly different idea Mm -hmm. of how gender identity, gender roles even come about. And from this section forward, she starts troubling the idea of identity itself. Yep. Uh, So she starts asking, well, how... How is it that we've come up with this idea that there's this interior psychic space where identifications are made? Where, where is this thing? Where do we get this idea from? What point did we move from something exterior and move it interior at all? Mm -hmm. Uh, And there's lots of disagreements on how that came about too. Yeah. That's about right. I mean, she has further discussions of how the construction of what we think are our interior, these interior identities are in fact just um, constructions on the basis of a norm that we're reading back into our prehistory. So she even goes so far as to say, you know, the, the various anatomical features that we associate with like sexual desire and sexual pleasure, the very, uh, limitation of those as being sexual is itself a construction that is trying to limit um, pleasure, sexual drive to 
heterosexual reproductive um, functions. Mm -hmm. And so it's not the case. I mean, this is where, you know, she's just not going to take a, um, she's not going to take kindly to any view of a teleological argument on the basis of our, of our sexual anatomy, because she's going to say, actually, there's a psychological way in which the very restriction of pleasure and sexualness to particular anatomy is itself part of the construction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think there's anything more to say in okay. that section. Last one, and then we're done with chapter two. I told you this would be quick, but I promise. Lots of Freudian talk later on. Uh, reformulating prohibition as power. Yeah. So uh, this is a point where she takes Foucault's critique of Freud and then critiques Foucault's critique of Freud using Foucault. Amazing. <laughs> Very exciting. Um, so uh, her question is, do we actually need uh, a universal incest taboo or story of oppression, um, or even a story of this previous happy state where there there was no oppression of your sexuality, in order to show that things are oppressive now. So this is kind of going back to her critique of the structuralist narrative, and I think what she's getting at is: do we need uh, do we need a structuralist narrative now to show that things are oppressive now? Do we no. need to? always go back to this time before um, in order to be dissatisfied with the present. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think you're, you're free to complain at any time. I think you're always free to be unhappy. So That's my take. <laughs> Foucault has this idea that she really takes up and becomes pretty structural to her thought, which is that, um, so I'm reading here, the notion of an original sexuality forever repressed and forbidden is a production of the law which subsequently functions as its prohibition. So this might seem odd, but um, the typical, like, I guess, liberal sort of understanding of sexuality is that, you know, it's this positive energy, it's this wonderful desire that we all have, but that is repressed mm -hmm. and prohibited by various cultural forces, religion. And if we could only unleash it in some way, um, you know, and free it from its you know, the oppressive structures that bind it, then we would be happy. It would be liberating. We would enter into the authenticity, as it were, mm -hmm. of um, sexual desire and, and sex. And what Foucault says is that this idea, the very idea we have of you know sex as itself a authentic drive, um, is of course yet again uh, the effect of our own construction right this isn't this itself he says kind of paradoxically that the prohibition is what gives us this idea of it mm -hmm. so it's not that this sexual thing is happening and then the prohibition comes and now it's repressed it's that we begin prohibiting right in order to create the very idea that sex is this authentic expression mm -hmm. um, that if we only like could get beyond various oppressions that we would um that we would be free and in this, Foucault is, is really just talking about like the production of scarcity or, or uh, it's a fancy way of saying creating a problem where there isn't a problem because when you describe things as a problem, then human beings become more malleable by other powers in order to mm -hmm. solve what they perceive now as a problem, right? You know, uh, maybe a simple way of describing this is if I like convince a bunch of kids like everyone needs to wear green hats, then I have more motivation if I get them to believe this in some way. Um, by creating a prohibition against not wearing green hats or whatever, then I create in them uh, certain desires for the hats that they didn't previously have, mm -hmm. right? And now I can manipulate them more, right? I can control their actions more because there's some extrinsic thing which I can say, well, if you want a green hat, then you better ought to eat your lunch or whatever, right? Yeah, it's so just I, kind of reverse psychology. Yeah, yeah. Well, not even reverse. It's just like introducing yeah. a, a, a problem. Um, and so this is something of Foucault's uh, description of prohibition in, in relation to our our liberal sense that sex is this like authentic thing within us that just needs to be unleashed. Is he saying no, no, no? What what power really wants is control, and maybe it's for you know maybe it, it wants you to reproduce 
this is the likely story so that there's more workers for various attempts at amassing capital. Um, but maybe it just wants you to be on call for whatever, you know, whatever it needs. Um, but it is creating the category of sex to make a population that is more malleable to suggestion in order to fulfill that um, now posited sexual authenticity, to become authentic, whereas he thinks previously there was just no problem. And so in some ways, you know, Foucault is very naive here, but I do think there's something about it, right, where you, where you see like... Um, well, it's basically the genealogical critique that yeah. she's taking from him in the first place. What, who is this serving? Like, what, what right. is this construct serving? And so you just follow the power. Yeah, I mean, you can see it. Like, if you, if you just see the way that we're convinced to both, like, work or have children on the basis of a search for sexual authenticity, you can see the certain logic in what he's saying. Like, mm -hmm. by prohibiting it, making it appear as something that is, like, you know, striving against prohibition, then we're very susceptible to people saying, like, if you want to fulfill this authentic sexual energy that you have, mm -hmm. you need to be a real woman and join the workforce, right? Or, you know, start having kids or whatever it is. But the yeah. point is that it's not true. It's just for the sake of some other power game. So that's what she thinks is Foucault in his clearest. Um, yeah. But she thinks that Foucault is actually inconsistent with himself later on. And that comes in chapter three. Yeah, that's right. Groovy. All right, chapter three, where we want to be. Subversive bodily acts. I've never performed a subversive bodily act. So I was eager to learn what they were. I didn't learn that much. Learned how to ask rhetorical questions. Okay, I'll, I'll take this first part because okay. we talked a little bit about it. So the first is called The Body Politics of Julia Kristeva. I think I'm saying that right. Um, and... Yep, again, it's a critique of the assertion of a primal beginning, what what Butler calls an archaic biology, where essentially Kristeva um, looks at that original scene of the child-mother unity and says that um, what the patriarchy really is is the uh, prohibition of any return to that mother-child unity. So it becomes a sort of... Um, she calls it a pre-discursive libidinal economy, um, but which is essentially the um, particular um, that has to be destroyed in order to get to a universal um, subject. Um, you can't be a fulfilled baby. You have to be um, rudely ripped out of that. And so um, Kristeva describes, uh, she says, she describes this original scene as a heterogeneous field of impulse prior to the separation slash individuation of infant and mother affected by the imposition of the incest taboo. Um, so for Kristeva, she's saying that there is this um, lost world, which is essentially feminine. Um, and which is only recoverable through non like logical speech. So she says poetic speech is a mm -hmm. sort of return to this fem this original maternal feminine. And then she also says giving birth um, for a woman is uh, a maternity for a woman is a re-identification with your mother in some way. Like you become what your mother was. Um, and so there's these two points at which you can sort of regain this lost world. And Butler's critique is what you might expect, namely that you're positing it as a last world, as a lost world, um, which is itself a construction of like the patriarch patriarchal power, because they essentially, essentially, um, in order to be human, in order to be a subject, in order to be rational, you still have to repudiate that maternal feminine. Um, so, so in the end, like the truly human, the truly rational, the truly cultural is still a uh, repudiation of what everything that we might call maternal or feminine. Mm -hmm. It's just that Christopher is trying to make room for these moments where you can sort of reconnect. But she argues that if you were ever to really fully, you know, repudiate this sort of masculine language based world, 
for the feminine, it would just be psychosis. Like it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be pretty. Um, so, so Butler's critique is just, well, it's another world being posited as a sort of original state of nature, which is actually in the service of patriarchy because it makes everything we think of as women as this sort of pre linguistic reality that, um, ultimately is what men or the masculine uses to identify itself saying mm -hmm. not that not that not that yeah it's that's just how another I it it affirms a, a hierarchy yet again in another way especially because in the west we prioritize uh i don't know like meaning over chaos mm -hmm. uh identity over nothing which i think is entirely reasonable but i think she points out earlier in the chapter two text uh, is that anything that makes movements where you have um, any kind of hierarchy between uh, like chaos and meaning that that is misogynist because there's been a, a history of women being symbolically connected to matter or earth or time or chaos uh -huh. and that's always subordinated to the symbol of man which has to do with stability and meaning, logos, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, and that, and that, you know, since you can never... One of the things she says very often is that anything that you're going to talk about as being before language, um, which is pretty much what all these theorists are doing, is trying to find somewhere prior to language um, to talk about the origins of the language-using subject, um, is anytime you do that, it's a bit suspicious because you're using language to define and describe a pre-linguistic reality. Um, so you're already imputing into it some kind of norm um, that comes from language. Mm -hmm. So, you, And this is throughout her books. I mean, Butler is constantly trying to figure out how we can speak of something prior to the speaking being. Um, and this is another instance where she says, you know, she doesn't really critique this so much as ask the question like, okay, if you're going to just pretty much arbitrarily say that the original sort of mother-child relationship is this pre-linguistic discursive reality, like who is it serving? Because mm -hmm. it's just another construction as much as saying that it's, you know, what whatever else, whatever other construction you may have. So who, who does it actually serve? And again, she says it serves patriarchal power in the end to have women sort of discussed in that way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, section two, we're back to Foucault again. Foucault, Herculine, and the politics of sexual discontinuity. So this is uh, the part where she points out Foucault's naivete, like you were saying earlier. Mm -hmm. So his project, this is on page 96, his own project to be uh, an inquiry into how the category of sex and sexual difference are constructed within discourse as necessary features of bodily identity. So how is it that we go from sex to, and this is now my identity, he thinks it has to do with power, um, but he kind of has this inconsistent critique uh, in the case of Herculine Barbin, who is this... Uh, French hermaphrodite, um, who we have, I think, journals, personal accounts, journals. Yeah. And then some medical records. Um, but he was very fascinated with this character and uh, wrote on her a lot. And then um, he, uh, he predicts that the disappearance of sex results in a happy dispersal of these various functions, meanings, organs, somatic and physiological processes, as well as the proliferation of pleasures outside of the framework of intelligibility enforced by univocal sexes within a binary relation. Yeah. So he looks at the situation and just thinks, oh, wow, isn't this great? I think this is what we're all going for. This seems like the, the place of pleasure without limits. Yeah, but Butler is saying this is very unlike Foucault in some ways because mm -hmm. he's basically doing the same thing, positing a prior uh experience of basically a um sort of formless shifting polyvalent sexuality that can take a whole number of um, sexual positions and take a whole number of objects of sexual attraction and basically utilize them in a very free way uh he refers to uh 
it as um, bucolic. I'm not sure if I'm saying that word right. And innocent pleasures. Um, and I and I would like to point this out because this is sort of an interesting point. As people might know by now, uh, Foucault is at least credibly accused of pedophilia with very young children in Tunisia, um, in a in a fairly like like insofar as it can be a problematic, it is very problematic, mm-hmm. right? And it's not just you know some arbitrary claim to link him with that. It's also in his writing. So one of the things he talks about in the history of sexuality is he talks about, um, a Butler refers to it as intergenerational sexual exchange, which is a, oh, that's uh, a very nice way of putting euphemism it. Euphemism if I've ever heard of one. Um, but, but in fairness, Butler is critiquing, uh, is critiquing him here as being naive. Um, but that he has this tendency, he definitely has this tendency to refer to um, that those sort of sexual relations as being um, prior to um, law, prior to some kind of prohibition. And he was also one of the one of the signers of the that infamous document to lower the uh, age of consent um, in France. I think this was oh, in nineteen seventy seven to lower it to the age of thirteen. Now, oh, wow. a lot of defenders of this will say, okay, he did that. But look, I mean, there's nations in which the age of consent is 11 and 14 and 13. And, you know, like, so Mm -hmm. what's, you know, uh, but I think when you take it all together, you have a sense that this is a man who has an understanding of um, the way that power can make something appear natural that isn't really, but who hasn't quite gotten beyond what I would just call his own vice in that he is still, even against some of his thought, asserting this kind of like original, innocent sexual desire that can just mm-hmm. take any object without problems. And Butler is calling him out for this and saying, not, not so much for pedophilia, but pointing out that this is inconsistent, totally inconsistent with, mm-hmm. with himself, which is how all vice makes us. Vice always makes us inconsistent. Um, but saying, okay, now you're positing exactly what you said you weren't going to posit namely a uh, sort of liberating energy force that if we could just get over our hangups, we would all experience. So there's this interesting, like, um, somewhat horrifying Pauline thing happening with um, Foucault, that he has a sort of law, uh, you know, of the spirit and a law of the flesh, and they're obviously at war here. My only caveat on that is I think the law of the spirit is dubious for Foucault here as well as a lot of the flesh, but, um, but yeah, Butler's taking him to task for that. But then she uh, transitions on page one hundred six, uh, concluding unscientific postscript. Yeah, uh, which is a, yeah. I'm not exactly well, sure how reference she... there. I don't know why, besides that she's about to talk about science and she's concluding, so it makes sense. Where'd that go? Oh yeah, it's a short section, and, and I think mm-hmm. I, I want to point out the section because it's interesting, and it's it's kind of weird in that she suddenly is dealing with um, science, science, like in the sense that we all mean it, usually, um, and it also seems to me to be pretty much pretty incisive. So I think a lot of times I get lost in Butler's sort of mm-hmm. okay, everything's construction, everything's construction, blah blah blah. We know what's coming almost, but this seems to be a more interesting point because she turns she she's just trying to point to a real clear example in which what Science we think falls short. yeah what we think and what we believe affects what we th- what we perceive as facts. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to go through this real quick because I think it can explain not only her position but also a sort of Catholic. Uh, critique of materialism so she's talking about a study which happened sometime in the 90s um, where there was a hypothesis of a uh, master gene which controls sexual differentiation um, which constitutes i'm reading here constitutes a specific dna sequence on the y chromosome okay so it it makes the, the sexual chromosome a y chromosome uh, it was called at the time the binary switch upon which hinges all sexual dimorphic characteristics. Okay, so if this, if this uh, DNA, uh, I'm going to pretend that I'm a STEM major. If this DNA sequence <laughs> is on, as it were, uh, you get the Y chromosome, you get the, you get the male, um, 
and then if you don't, you get the female. And she says, you know, part of this was the research was inspired by this fact, which is true. A good 10% of the population has chromosomal chromosomal variations that do not fit into the XX female and XY male set of categories. Um, so often you'll hear from the sort of materialist crowd that what makes one male, what makes one female is your chromosomes. So mm -hmm. if those are in fact a material cause of a simply material reality, then it is troubling to find inconsistencies. inconsistencies. It's like, okay, well, if that's supposed to be the cause, I'm pointing to a XY uh, chromosomal, chromosomal um, organism that's nevertheless presenting in other ways as female. So this, this is, you know, troubling in some way. Um, and it seems arbitrary to simply say, well, I don't care what the other expressions are. If you have this sexual chromosome, you are, in fact, a female. We'll get into that a little bit. Yep. Um, so the reason these, these uh, scientists were researching what they were researching is because they were positing a master gene that could explain, as it were, um, the differences or these inconsistencies. Because then they could say, okay, look, maybe the master gene doesn't effectively create the Y chromosome in this instance, but the presence of it, we can show that normally it's supposed to, it's just variations mean that it means that it doesn't. Um, and they found it and they did find that it, that it effectively can, you know, uh, switch on a Y chromosome. But the problem is that they found it, uh, in both men and women. Mm -hmm. So they found it on the X chromosome in men and X chromosome in women. And so then there was the assertion that um, said perhaps it was not the presence of the gene sequence in males versus its absence in females that was determining of sex, but that it was active in males and passive in females. So it was sort of like a catalyst that was turning turning something on. Um, and she notes, she says, uh, Aristotle lives with an exclamation point, <laughs> um, which is a reference to the fact that um, – and this isn't simply a this isn't simply a joke because what she's trying to show is that what we think about the meaning of gender is going to influence the kind of scientific facts that we that we suggest mm -hmm. exist. And so if you have as sort of this background belief, um, the association of masculinity with activity and femininity with passivity as the material cause of sexual difference, which Aristotle does, um, then you're going to have then this is going to seem more plausible. Um, even if it is a purely hypothetical conjecture. Mm -hmm. So the, the the biological belief of Aristotle's day is that the the human person in the womb is naturally going to tend toward a male body. That's the perfection, the the form of the human person. If there's some defect while the baby is in the womb, then it's going to turn out female. Yeah, a material deficiency in some way. Um, and we'll get into that in our in our direct discussion on Aristotelian and Thomistic descriptions of gender. Um, but that's even kind of a sideline to this. So she says that um, clearly there are cases in which the component parts of sex do not add up to the recognizable coherence or unity that is usually designated by the category of sex, right? So this is a materialist problem because all you mm -hmm. have is component parts. So if you have some shifting of the component parts, um, then this troubles the idea of saying, this is a man or this is a woman because it's supposed to just be the addition of component parts. That's all you have within a materialist universe. This incoherence troubles uh, the argument for it is unclear why we should agree that the, uh, so now I need to back up the The subjects they used for this scientific experiment were people who we would now call people undergoing some kind of intersex condition. Mm -hmm. So I'll just read this um, quote from one of the studies here. So the, f the four XX males whom they studied were all sterile, no sperm production. Um, and again, it's odd to be a uh, XX male. Recall that. So the four XX males whom they studied were all sterile, no sperm production. They had small testes, which totally lacked germ cells. That is the precursor cells for sperm. They also had high hormone levels and low testosterone levels. And then the study goes on. Presumably, they were classified as males because of their external genitalia and the presence of testes. Similarly, both of the XY females' external genitalia were normal, but their ovaries lacked germ cells. So what Butler says is this incoherence is troubling because 
um, it's unclear why we should agree at the outset that these are XX males and XY females, mm -hmm. right? So she's saying when it is precisely the designation of male and female that is under question and that it is implicitly already decided by recourse to external genitalia. So what, what, what's being argued here? Well, they're saying like if, if you are going to say that I need a case of a male, of someone who is a male as a, as a total description, um, where the various component parts have failed to appear in the normal way, right? Then you're already saying that there is some way that you know these males apart from all the component parts because mm -hmm. you're going to go pick them out. Yeah, if you if you can say that this is an XX male and this is an XY female, you've already decided that they belong definitively to this male female male female on the basis category. of external genitalia. So if that's what what makes them male or female, why why do we need to find uh, this master gene in the first place? Right, and that's what she says. She says indeed, if external genitalia were sufficient as a criterion by which to determine or assign sex, which they were sufficient in the mind of the scientists to take those people and say, all right, these are the males. Uh, so if these external genitalia were sufficient, then the experimental research into the master gene would hardly be necessary at all. Um, and I think there's a certain point here that's worth, you know, that's worth considering. It's saying that within a material universe, you have this problem that if you're going to try and test for things that make men men and make women women as the material cause of that fact, then you have this, this circular problem where you have to go find the people you think are men and find the people that you think are women and then test them. And so what but all Butler is saying is that our beliefs, right, are initial for her, just constructions of what a male is and what a female is. Um, are going to determine which facts appear as evidence of this. Or as, as causal. As ca yeah, right, exactly. Um, I'm going to try an analogy. We'll see if it works. But, I mean, you can imagine it like you're like a little kid and you have to set up your science experiment. And so you're trying to find out what factors causes X thing to happen. And so you in your mind, you've come up with three different reasons. And so you test and see, well, which which reason is it that will give me this outcome, but maybe because you're a fifth grader, you're just not that creative and like you're missing that there's 10 other reasons that you could have mm -hmm. included in this experiment. Right. But since you didn't, since you were looking for these three categories, you were able to find correlations in the data, the, the cause and the effect, um, but only because you were looking for those things. And maybe you, you miss the real cause mm -hmm. simply because you weren't looking for it. So right. you find what you look for yeah. is what I'm getting from this. And the, the first time that I was trying to understand this critique and take it seriously. Um, I had a hard time doing it, but I think what what helped me to to take the critique seriously is to, to remind myself over and over again that you're coming at this from a materialist viewpoint. Right. You have to be able to explain everything in terms of matter. The only cause that you have is a material and efficient cause. Right. Uh, and whenever you find yourself limited to those things, things just get inevitably really tricky. And so suddenly when you're in this kind of cramped worldview, then the critique starts to make sense. Now, I don't think that most like average people go around like really convinced um, in material atheism. Like we all generally yeah. believe things that are inconsistent with that worldview, namely that there are identities at all. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, we don't think, we don't see the strength of that argument because it's really hard to actually fully and consistently put yourself into that mindset. All yeah. there is is matter. Yeah, because normally what we think, which I think is right, is that all of the component parts are an expression of something that transcends matter. Um, so that when I find a master gene and when I find a chromosome pattern and when I find external genitalia, the reason I'm not, you know, looking for the one that causes all the others is because I don't think that any of them cause all the others. But in fact, if you want to talk about a cause, it's uh, the form or, or to put it another way, um, the creation of the being as male or female is itself mm -hmm. um, the cause. And those various attributes and components and, and meaningful functional parts are expressions of the way that that being was created. I think that's actually how people go about their lives dealing with it. Yeah, I you know, think so. But not materialists, I guess. 
Yeah, you're you're left in a much uh, trickier or troubling situation. Okay, so there, a scientific, a critique of science. And that's it. Bellic. That's that's all you get. Yeah. Chromosomes, man. Okay, that's the first half of our discussion. We're going to take a break now and then split this thing into two videos again because everything takes longer than you think. It's because it's Butler. Yeah, totally Butler's fault. So we'll see you next time.